John chapter 2. We're going to be reading through the first story of chapter 2, the first 12 verses of John chapter 2. But it's interesting in a lot of ways. For a book that opens up with maybe the most expansive vision of Jesus Christ in a single chapter in Scripture, we open up chapter 2 in the next day of events in the life of Jesus and his disciples in a sort of shockingly ordinary moment, an ordinary day. Maybe even in some ways we would think of this as an ordinary miracle. But on second glance, this turns out to be anything but ordinary. We've been introduced to this Jesus in chapter 1 in these extraordinary terms, the way John talks about and describes Jesus to us. And then the way John the Baptist describes Jesus to us. And then the way Jesus' disciples come to know who he is. All these grand and expansive and glorious terms. And now we find Jesus in a nearby village. A little village called Cana in Galilee. He and his mom and his disciples at a wedding. This little village of Cana in Galilee is another small town in the hillsides to the northwest of the Sea of Galilee. It's less than 10 miles from Nazareth, and Nazareth is the childhood home of Jesus Christ. And it's very close to the Sea of Galilee and where Jesus and John the Baptist have been and where Jesus has found his disciples, and we're very near to where Jesus grew up. So Jesus and his mother and his disciples have all been invited to this wedding. You may know the story. Um, after a period of time, the host runs out of wine. And then things get really interesting from that point on. And we really are struck when we read through this by how ordinary or daily this kind of event is. We're even struck by how behind the scenes this event is. It's not one of these miracles that awes the crowd and thousands of people begin to follow Jesus. It's actually done in a side room and only a handful of people know. So why does John, the disciple, record this miracle for us? Why does he record this miracle first for us? Let's remember again that near the very end of this gospel, John tells us, I have written all of these things. He did so many other things, but I've ordered these for you so that you might believe and that believing in Jesus Christ, you would have life in his name. So this is on purpose. Why does John record this one for us first? One of the other things we're struck by in this story is this interaction between Jesus and his mother, Mary. What about this interaction? Jesus actually pushes back a little bit on the request that Mary makes of him, but he still performs the miracle anyway. What are we to make of that conversation? So what's going to help us make sense of this story? Um, sort of absorb what John the disciple wants us to see and hear about what's going on. So here are some thoughts about what's going to help us make sense of this passage of Scripture. First of all, um, very simply, John actually chooses this miracle story on purpose for us. It's here in this order and in this place on purpose for us. John tells us, that this was the first of the signs that Jesus did. And even though as we think of this story, we think of Jesus and his mom, we think of Jesus turning water into wine, it was the best of the marriage feast, where the story ends is it tells us that Jesus did this and he revealed his glory to his disciples and he believed in his name. So that's where this miracle story is headed. The revelation of the glory of Jesus Christ John has told us several times in chapter 1, he was, word in flesh, full of the glory of God. And we saw the glory of God in Jesus. So he chooses and says, Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in his name. So John chooses these miracle stories on purpose. In fact, I think it can be said that John chooses all of his miracle stories for the same two purposes. To reveal the glory of Jesus Christ and to cause belief in Jesus so that we might have life in his name. Now, you're into this, if you're into this kind of thing, I'm going to sort of lay a little bit of the structure of this gospel out for you. John includes all of the miracle stories except for the resurrection in the first 11 chapters of his gospel. 
And in fact, it's often counted in such a way that John gives us seven signs, seven miracles that are done publicly for the revealing of the glory of God and the drawing of those into discipleship, of, of into belief in Jesus Christ. In fact, if you read through all of those miracle stories in John's gospel, they're full of either the language of belief in glory or the conversation of belief in glory. And people are coming to believe in Jesus Christ. So John does this on purpose. And then when we get into chapters 12 and 13, we are now on the way to the cross. So Jesus is dealing with what it means to get to the cross and through the cross and into the resurrection, into his ascension, what the kingdom of God looks like. But this is why John structures his gospel this way for us, is through these seven public signs about the glory of Jesus Christ and belief in his name. So John chooses this for us on purpose. And then there's no getting around it. In fact, it's an important piece of what this is all about. We have a wedding and we have some wine. It really is significant that Jesus chooses a wedding. And it really is significant that Jesus turns water into wine in this story. An immediate need is filled. Mary comes and says, they're out of wine. And so when the stone jars are filled with water and Jesus turns it into wine and it's given, he fills an immediate need. But then we're given a glimpse into something even greater. The more we pay attention to what this story means, we get even a more expansive vision of Jesus Christ and of the kingdom of God. So the wedding and the wine are also important to us. And this is where I want us to end this morning. This is what I personally was struck by when I went through this story this week. And it's the thought of obedience in emptiness. Obedience in emptiness. When the jars are empty... When every resource that we have is gone, but something still needs to be done, we have in this story a simple act of obedience. And when there's obedience and emptiness, Jesus takes that and he turns it into the best, better than everything else that has been consumed up to that point. Obedience and emptiness. Hang on to that thought this morning as we work our way through this passage. So let's just read the story. John chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, it goes like this. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called to the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. In other words, when no one can tell the difference anymore, you bring out the cheap stuff. But you have kept the good wine until now. This... The first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. On the third day, there was a wedding. We mentioned this last time. If you sort of read through the the rhythm Of John chapter 1 into John chapter 2, every section begins with something to the effect of the next day John the Baptist said this. The next day John the Baptist saw Jesus. The next day Jesus and his disciples did this. And so that pattern of day-by-day interaction with Jesus Christ, day-by-day revelation of who he is, learning who Jesus is, Jesus walking with his disciples through daily normal life continues. 
So we've gone from this mountaintop, expansive vision of the glory and greatness and divinity of Jesus Christ to Jesus now walking with us through our daily lives. And we find ourselves with him and his disciples at a joyous and wonderful event, but something that's going to be over time fairly common. Someone close to the family has said of friends, there's a wedding, so we're going to go and be a part of that, and we're going to rejoice with them about their wedding. So these are all normal life events that we all relate to. Jesus, and we can't lose track of this fact. The way John lays this out, we're forced to pay attention to it. Jesus is in our normal days. He is in our normal events. He is in our daily lives when we put our hand to the plow and we do our normal job, when we wake up in the morning, when we spend time with our family and our relationships and all that we do, Jesus is in our daily lives and our normal lives and all of creation become become an opportunity for the glory of Jesus Christ. Everything about our days can be infused with who Jesus is, all of creation around us is filled with the glory of God. The psalmist says it proclaims day and night, pours forth speech about the glory of God. So our normal lives and all of creation, friends, we can't lose sight of this. This is an opportunity for the glory of God, and that's part of what happens in this passage. Canaan, this little village, it's close by. Turns out, we learn later on in the Gospel of John, it's actually the hometown of Nathaniel. Nathaniel is the last disciple we saw in chapter 1. So Jesus may have actually been in Cana when he speaks to Nathaniel or close to Cana in Galilee. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is mentioned first in the story. And that's interesting because we're close by, we're at a wedding, Mary's mentioned first. Mary somehow has connection to the preparation for the wedding because she's the one who knows we've run out of wine. So this wedding taking place is probably a close family friend of Mary and Jesus. So she goes and her son, Jesus, is invited and the disciples are invited along with Jesus. So we get this actual intimate connection. It's not just a random wedding. Jesus just shows up because he's Jesus. We actually have some sort of family and friend connection between Mary and the host who runs out of the wine and Jesus and his disciples. And we know as well, history tells us this a lot, and even in Scripture we see this. Weddings in their culture are a great big deal. It's a community event. It's an extended family event. It is often a multi-day event. There's a lot to take care of, and it's a hospitality culture. So you bring as many people in as you possibly can, and you take care of them as long as you can. And so it's a certain kind of embarrassment if you run out of supplies for the people that you have invited for this great big event, and the wine has run out. There's all this work to be done, and there's a lot to celebrate. And it's a season of joy for family and friends at this wedding. So we reach this moment, wherever it is, in the process of this celebration, Mary discovers they've run out of wine. You can't run out of wine at at, at a celebration like this. So Mary feels some level of responsibility at this moment, and so she goes to the son that she knows can fix it. You, 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 parents, you know this. You go to the child who you know will actually do something about it, right? You know this. She goes to the son that she knows can actually do something about it. And it leads to this really curious conversation. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother just turned to the servants and said, just do whatever he tells you to do. Part of what's beautiful about these conversations is you get, a, you get kind of a feel for some of these personalities and, and some of these interactions. It's curious. And in the end, it's a very human conversation between Mary and her oldest son, Jesus. So Jesus says, woman, what does this have to do with me? And in the English, for us, that feels a a little short. If you've ever called your wife woman, you know how that goes, right? So in English, it comes off a little short. 
It doesn't necessarily have to be that way in, in their culture, the words, the language that they use. And the word that he used literally just means woman, so that is the word that he uses. But later on in the gospel, in a very tender moment, Jesus calls her a woman again. He's actually hanging from the cross. And at the foot of the cross, we have his mother Mary and we have John the disciple. And here is Jesus dying on the cross and, and he speaks to his mom and he says, woman, here is your son. So he puts a family back together again in that moment and he uses the same word. So it comes off a little short to us, but it doesn't have to be short. It can still be something that has a certain kind of family tenderness in it somewhere. But then Jesus really does says, what does this have to do with me? And that's actually a pretty accurate translation of the idiom that Jesus uses. It's an idiom used a couple times in the Gospels. Once, when Jesus confronts a bunch of demons before he throws them into a herd of swine, they respond to him. They say, why are you here? Why are you doing this? And they use the same idiom. What does this have to, why, you know, why are you putting this together for us? And so Jesus says, why, why do you think these two things go together? I'm here and they're out of wine. What does this have to do with me? Mary eventually turns around and just tells him, just do whatever he tells you to do. He's going to be able to take care of this. But Jesus says something really interesting here that becomes a certain kind of subplot to the Gospel of John. And in some ways, and in other parts of the Gospels as well, he tells his mom, and probably his disciples around him there at the same time, he says, look, my hour has not yet come. Jesus says this kind of thing a couple of times to the Gospels. And even a few times when he doesn't directly say, now is not the moment, he'll act in such a way as to avoid public acclaim or to avoid a certain kind of public reaction to what he is saying because his hour has not yet come. So when Jesus says this very early on in John's Gospel, we're intended to sort of be piqued in our interest. We now anticipate, well, if now is not the hour, when is his hour? This great and glorious Jesus Christ, we can barely understand who he is and all of his divinity because of what we've learned in chapter 1. And now he says, but my hour's not yet come. What does that mean? What is his hour? And when will it actually show up? Jesus is actually going to say something very much like this to his brothers in a few chapters. He's going to tell his disciples a couple of times in a couple of different ways, my moment for my glorification is not yet. And every time Jesus says this kind of thing, he is putting us off. He is growing our anticipation for what that means, and it turns out it's the cross. It's part of this beautiful path that the Gospel of John takes us on. In fact, at one point in John chapter 8, in this open confrontation with his religious enemies, Jesus says, I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. I'm not doing this to openly display my glory at this point, but my heavenly Father, he is the one who will glorify me. This becomes an interesting thing for the disciples to figure out the more they follow Jesus. It becomes a really important thing for you and me to figure out as we follow Jesus Christ now. Jesus in this story, he's actually avoiding the path of public acclaim. Jesus is gathering disciples. Jesus is starting to touch lives in really interesting and powerful ways. Jesus is beginning to reveal the kingdom of God, talk about the kingdom of God. So as these kinds of things happen, the disciples are starting to learn, oh, this is what it means to follow this kind of person. This is what the kingdom of God actually looks like. Jesus is headed to crucifixion and then eventually to resurrection. But the disciples can't yet absorb all of that, much less those who are sort of on the outer fringes. My hour has not yet come. I'm not going to do something spectacular for the entire group of people. That's not what I'm here to do. But Jesus instead does something different in a side room for a handful of those who are starting to follow him. Jesus just works in different ways than other public figures do. Rather than some form of political or religious 
this campaign, Jesus is building disciples, teaching them who he is so that they can turn around and teach others who he is and gain disciples for Jesus Christ as well. And yet with all of that, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And yet with all of that, Jesus still performs the miracle. He won't do it for the public, but he will do it for the small group who knows and, and for his, maybe even his mother as well. It's not for public acclaim. It turns out, John tells us, this is for the revealing of his glory to his disciples and even those servants who knew where this had all come from and that they might believe in him, put their trust in him even more. So Mary tells these servants, do whatever he tells you to do. And then they have these six empty stone jars. They're normally filled for purification rites. So those who had come for the wedding would have washed themselves inside of these jars. But by now, these jars are empty, probably because of all of the activity of this wedding and all of the people coming and going and all of the feasting and eating and everything that takes place. These jars for, uh, for, for cleansing and for washing have been emptied because of all of this work. So he tells these servants, I need you to fill the jars with water. So the wine needs to come from somewhere. And their job is relatively simple. It is something they would have done probably on a daily basis. It is to fill the empty jars with what they had on hand. This is what these jars hold. Just fill them with water. That's what I want you to do. So they fill the jars. And then they fill pitchers. This actually requires, this is important, friends. What happens in this story requires their participation could Jesus had ma have made wine appear out of nowhere inside of those stone jars? Yes, he could have. But what he asks them to do is a simple act of obedience. Just fill these jars with water. I'll take it from there. So they fill the pitchers now with what used to be water. They take it to the master of the feast, who is likely the one who's in charge of the provision. He tastes it, and he goes to the groom and the groom's family, and he says, this is the best. I can't believe you saved the best until last. Here is this small picture of a larger truth in the Gospel of John, a larger truth instead of our walk with Jesus Christ. Simple obedience to a simple command. Simple obedience to a simple command. Christ is asking us to follow him, not just to learn who he is, be in awe of who he is, but to learn how to hear his voice, to learn how to read his word and understand what it is that Christ is asking us to do, how it is the epistles describe the life of the follower of Jesus Christ. This is what we put on as followers of Jesus. This is what we take off. This is what the fruit of the Spirit looks like. This is what the fruit of the flesh looks like. We are now people of the Spirit. We are now people who have put on the things of Christ. Simple obedience to the simple command. He didn't ask them to do anything complicated or something they did not know how to do. It was ordinary for them. I need you to do something like this. Just fill these jars with water. Simple obedience. Simple belief in what Jesus says becomes the act that leads to the glory of God. Remember something we said early on in this study. Maybe the most important verb in the entire gospel is believe. Jesus did this to reveal his glory, and his disciples believed in him. A simple act of obedience, a simple act of trust in what Jesus tells me to do as simple as it may be, leads to the glory of God. So often inside of the Christian's life, we come to these giant moments. We come to these important moments. We come to a crossroads in our life. And we just have the feeling that we know the most important thing for me to do right now is what God wants me to do because this is a big decision. And so typically in those moments, that's when we are um, brought back to in our hearts and our minds to, all right, God, what is it that you want me to do? Because, man, this is a big decision. This is a big one.
But I got to tell you, friends, if we have not been obedient in the simple things in our normal daily lives, we're going to have a very hard time hearing the voice of God and then obeying it in those great big moments. A simple thing. Just fill the jar with water, and I'll take it from there. What does obedience look like in our daily lives to actually do what God is asking us to do? That's the kind of walk we need to have. And when those servants do that, it turns out it's the best wine of the celebration. But you have kept the best wine until now. Why was it the best wine? Because it's what Jesus did. It's not what they did. It's not what they could buy. It's not what they could make under their own power. It's what only Jesus could do. That's why it's the best possible thing. What Jesus did was better than anything else they could have done or could have bought. Even though, I love this little fact, even though most at the wedding did not know it was him, all of them benefited from the miracle of Jesus Christ. Most folks don't know it. We may not even know it on a regular basis, but our lives depend upon the hand of Christ day after day after day after day. Even if we don't know it, we benefit from the work of Christ. So friends, an ordinary act of obedience becomes extravagant abundance in Jesus Christ. Extravagant abundance in Jesus Christ. So John the disciple chooses this miracle. Jesus turning water into wine at a wedding. Let's think about the wedding for a moment. Jesus does honor a wedding with this miracle. He fills a need. He puts things back in order as far as hospitality is concerned. And as far as this family taking care of everybody else is concerned, he does just fill a need and he honors a wedding. <clears throat> Friends, a wedding represents that family coming together, husband and wife in the beginning of family. We need to understand this because the church of Jesus Christ needs to be abundantly clear on this simple fact. The wedding, the family of husband and wife is God's first institution. It is the very foundation of the rest of human civilization. It is why when the enemy wants to corrode human civilization, he goes straight for the family. When the Apostle Paul tells Timothy and he warns him about the false teaching that's going to come in the last days, one of the things he lists more than once, and it's interesting, and all of these things, these listings of false teachings and what it's going to sound like, he says they will forbid marriage. Why would the enemy do that? Because the enemy is going to corrode civilization by breaking the family. It's the very foundation of human civilization. It is the vehicle of passing beliefs and values and protection and provision from one generation to another. The joining of male and female is God's first created order among human beings, made in his image to steward the earth and to fill it with a bunch of other human beings who are smaller but look a lot like them. Fill the earth with more people like you. That's what God wants. Jesus honors this wedding, honors the institution of family, God's first foundational institution. But there is a wedding that is yet to come as well, where Jesus will provide everything for that union. You see, church, uh, Scripture likes to speak of the church as the bride of Christ, and Christ is the bridegroom. A little later on in John's gospel, John the Baptist is actually going to talk about Jesus and his disciples in exactly that kind of language. Paul, in his epistle to the Ephesians, he uses the image of husband and wife and family to speak of Christ and his church. Right? 
He says, now, all of this is great, but the mystery that I am talking about is Jesus and his church. So in Ephesians 5, 31 and 32, Paul says this, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and his church. There is this wedding, this joining, this union to come between Christ and his followers. We actually catch a glimpse of it when we are actually all gathered together with Jesus Christ. In the book that tells the story of the end of human history as we know it, in the book of Revelation, right near the end of all of those events, there's this, there's this moment where Christ is with his people, his bride, and in Revelation 19, verses 6 through 8, it is the image of what we call the marriage supper of the Lamb. And John, the disciple, who in that book we call John the Revelator, says this, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. That's us. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen. We are finished with the dirty, sinful things that we carry, and we've been granted righteousness. Bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. There's a wedding yet to come when you and I literally, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ in this place this morning, literally, you and I will be at this table clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And there, Jesus provides everything. And Jesus turns water into wine. It's a fascinating image and one that in the Old Testament is actually important for us in our understanding of the Messiah. And there is this Old Testament image of the abundance of the coming kingdom of the anointed one, the Messiah himself. When he comes and when his kingdom is established, the wine will never run out. There will be this abundance. And I know this is hard for teetotalers to listen to, but the wine will never run out. I won't ask for a show of hands. <laughs> Amos chapter 9 verse 13 gives us as clearly as any other place this image. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. It's just, it's going to be coming so fast, we're going to be stepping over each other to reap the harvest that God has given. The mountains shall drip sweet wine and the hills shall flow with it. This is the abundance, super abundance of the kingdom of God. So in this simple miracle, done in a normal event, so to speak, done for a very few people at a wedding in a small town, John the disciple wants us to begin to see Jesus the king, Jesus the bridegroom, Jesus the one who will clothe us in righteousness. Jesus, the one who brings in its abundance the kingdom of God. So the story closes with what John finds important. And through this, he manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. For those at the wedding, this is why this was done. So they could see his glory, and they could believe in Jesus Christ their Savior. So every moment in all of creation, I want to make sure we hear this, carries the potential of the glory and the power of God. But there's some important questions for that. Will we obey? Will we obey? Will we actually do what Christ has commanded us to do? Sometimes it really is the big thing. More often than not, it's the daily thing. It's the simple thing. It may even be something that we're asked to do over and over and over again. Will we obey? Will we see it when it happens? Will we be in the presence of Jesus Christ when it happens? 
Will our hearts and minds and spirits be attuned to what the Holy Spirit is doing? And will our eyes see it for what it is? Oh, this is, this is the glory of God. This is why I trust him. This is why I believe in him and in nobody else. Even when it doesn't look spectacular, even when it doesn't make the headlines, even when it's not something that everybody else is talking about and has gone viral on YouTube. Maybe I'm just the only one who sees it. But Jesus is here. And I've seen his glory. This is how the kingdom of God works so often. Jesus took ordinary water and turned it into something more, into the absolute best of the feast. And even more than that, Jesus took what was empty and he filled it with something better. The jars were empty, the servants obeyed and filled them and Jesus works his miracle. And here's one of where I want to make sure we think about this. What does obedience in emptiness look like? What does obedience in our emptiness look like? I have to admit that uh, when you start walking through a passage of Scripture like this, and I start reading and I start listening to what other people have said and I start taking notes and I start digging through translations and I start digging through language. My first reaction is always, ah, oh, we've heard this a thousand times. <laughs> I have to come up with something that makes you people think I'm cool. I have to come up with something. Sunday's coming. I can't stop it. <laughs> The more I sat with this passage, this is the way it spoke to me. And so it spoke to me first, very personally. You're empty. There's nothing else you think you can do with these hands, with these skills, with whatever set of abilities you think you have, but that's okay. Just fill the jar with water one more time. Just do that thing I've asked you to do. Do the last thing I've asked of you. Don't try to look for the next spectacular thing. Just do the last thing I asked you to do. Part of this, every now and then this story, the, the only phrase that rings in my head is what Mary said. Just do what he tells you to do. And I don't think it's just me. I think many of us find ourselves in some fashion in this place. Some kind of burnout, some kind of loss, some kind of confusion, some kind of new shape to life that seems less than or too different than what it used to be. Some kind of fear or confusion about the future and what it means. When the jars are empty and the way forward seems dim, what we're called to do is simply obey and simply believe that Jesus is able. Just do what he's asked you to do. So Jesus takes the ordinary, he takes the leftover and the runouts and turns it into something so much better. Empty jars and empty hands. We sang it this morning. You empty my hands, guess what's going to happen? You're going to find two empty hands lifted up in praise. One of the things I like about that song is it's a dare. It's not just we sing it in faith, it's a dare. It's you know what? When these hands feel empty and I feel as if things are opposite of the way they should be. Things have been taken away from me. The future's dim and I just don't know. And all I have are empty hands. I will lift them up and I will praise my Jesus. That's what I am going to do. These empty jars, these empty hands that are filled only with the ordinary and given to Jesus can become something so much more than what it used to be or even what was lost. It becomes something refreshing and new in Jesus Christ. You may already feel this way. You may already feel as if your hands are empty. 
And everything you have to offer, now get this, everything you have to offer is just water, but what they need is wine. Does that make sense? They need something more than what you and I have to offer, and that's absolutely right. That's exactly the right place for you and I to be in understanding what Jesus does. I just have this to offer. He has this to offer. So I'm going to take this, and I'm just going to let Jesus do with it what Jesus can do. Some of us need to come to that realization this morning. It's not me. It has to be Jesus. It has to be his wisdom. It has to be his power. Otherwise, I cannot supply what needs to be done, what really needs to be done. We may even need to find a way to stop long enough to offer God empty hands. But God does stuff like this for his children. Our God does stuff like this for his people. Psalm 34, verse 18. I know for some of you, this is, this is a very <clears throat> personal verse of Scripture. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. When David was fleeing from Saul and he found himself in a cave with only a handful of supporters, he writes Psalm 57. And here's how David emptied out and in a cave, already anointed to be king, but running for his life. Here's what he says in those first three verses. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. For in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples me. Selah. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. I'm not where I'm supposed to be, but my God is good. God will fulfill his purpose for me. And God will send his steadfast love and faithfulness for me. Abraham sent Hagar and their son Ishmael away with a bag of water and food. And when Hagar had run out of all the food and water, God shows up and saves her and her son. When Moses ran for his life and became a sheep herder in the desert, Forty years later, he suddenly sees a burning bush. Elijah confronts the enemies of God, wins the battle, runs for his life, hides in a cave all by himself, and God whispers to him, you are not alone. Jeremiah the prophet, rejected, broken, angry, and God reminds him that he was called by the God who rules the nations and restores the broken hearts. We get a glimpse in the Apostle Paul's life at the end of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Whatever kind of pain it was that he was enduring for who knows how long, he had prayed for God to take it away and God said, I won't. And here's what happens. Paul says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Just fill the jar with water one more time. Just give it to Jesus and let him do what only he can do.